What's up guys, SimoneFan101 here, and here's another review. This is my NXT TakeOver Toronto review. Um, NXT TakeOver, I'm going to go back, and here's the order I'm going to try to do this as soon as I can. I already did the main WWE pay-per-views until another one shows up, which it's going to at Money in the Bank, um, probably in the next week or so. Probably this, I, I don't forget the date of Money in the Bank, hang on. Uh, Money in the Bank. Money in the Bank, 2017. Let's see here. Your ball. Sunday, June 18th. That is literally six days from now. Didn't I just watch Extreme Rules? It's kind of funny. But um, this is my NXT TakeOver uh, Toronto review, as I said. And... Um, And the thing about this show is that, well, first of all, it was awesome. But the second, because it was in Canada, the show was very lively. And, and to go back to what I was saying a second ago, um, I'm going to do this show, my reviews in order like this. Because I, I have it on Google Box and I have it on printed paper here. Um, the amount of the shows I want to do. Uh, one of them I canceled out, which was uh, Ring of Honor Final Battle, because, yeah. Anyways, uh, the order I want to do these shows, I already did the main WWE pay-per-views, so there is that. After that, I wanted to do the TakeOver shows, which are Toronto, San Antonio, um, Toronto, San Antonio, Orlando, and Chicago. And uh, after that, I'm going to do TNA pay-per-views slash Impact pay-per-views. There's only one, which was a one-night-only show, which is actually pretty freaking good, I got to admit. Uh, it's actually a, it's a it's a decent good to good show. Um, then there's Ring of Honor. I I I did not want to do I want to do Final Battle at first, but I but I want to start with the Christopher Daniels ring, which was I believe 15th anniversary. If not, it was the show before that, and then go watch Ring of Honor shows from there. Um, after that, uh, it will be uh, WCPW. As, you know, Lucha Underground, they don't have pay-per-views exactly. They, though they do have big shows. Uh, by the way, Lucha Underground just came back, and so far that show kicks ass. No biggie. Or no shock, actually. Um, the WCPW, I have a few events here, including some I have to catch up on, uh, in terms of watching them. And after that will be New Japan, which I will start with Wrestle Kingdom, and then kind of bounce from show to show. Or I'll just mention the how, the great matches from each show, um, because I honestly have no real, I don't have too much time on my hands, so uh, I want to spend that time uh, watch, catching up on Ring of Honor and WCPW as I did watch them weekly, uh, and after that I'm going to um, I'm going to watch. Uh, you know, so I'll, I'll, I will go back and rewatch Russell Kingdom, or at least the highlights, and then I will go and watch the, not every single big show. I'm not going to watch the, the Junior Tournament. Uh, I will watch Dominion, because that has Omega Okada Round 2 in it. So I will see that. So th those are just my plans. Whether or not the plans are going to happen, I don't know. But hopefully they do. Um, anyways, as far as this show goes... The show is actually was actually Takeover Toronto. That is, uh, no shock. It was a frick. It was a fucking awesome show. Um, the show started off with Bobby Roode and Ty Dillinger. Uh, Roode and Dillinger had a pretty freaking good match on this show. I won't call. It. Some people are doing it four stars. I can't give that. I'll give it like three and a th three and three four stars. Three and a three and a third, or it's a three and a quarter. Pretty sure it's three and third. Anyways, who cares? Bottom line, really good match here. What really had the match going, but it wasn't just the in reaction, but the crowd. Keep in mind, both Bobby Roode and Ty Dillinger are from Canada. They're, they're Canadian natives. So, to have both of them uh, in this match uh, at the same time really got can the, the Toronto fans going. And, um... And as far as, but, but what about the match itself? Really good match. 
Uh, really good back and forth. Ty Dillinger definitely was the underdog here. Uh, Bobby Roode did pick up the win with a with the uh, implant DDT, which he calls it the glorious DDT. Uh, cool. Uh, really good match. Uh, it really this was the first really like big showcase of Ty Dillinger. In my opinion, Ty Dillinger delivered because. I mean, I'm not. We knew he was a good wrestler before, but we never really got a chance to see what he was really made of. And the match here with Rude proved it, as well as there was a fatal four-way match for uh, number one contendership for the NXT Championship a few weeks later. It was an elimination match that had Roderick Strong, Andrade Almas, Andrade Cien Almas, Bobby Rude, and Ty Dillinger. So. um... So and that was that honestly in my opinion was Ty Dillinger's best match. Um But this match here, pretty friggin' good. Uh just I, I I got really nothing else to say. Go check it out. Uh The Authors of Pain versus TM61. This was the finals of the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic. Um this was uh yeah, the, the finals of the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic. It was uh, it was also contested with Paul Ellering inside the Shark Cage, something that WWE hadn't done or any company hadn't really done in a long time. Actually, the last time I remember a Shark Cage being used was in uh, in TNA, two times actually. They or ironically enough both involved Velvet Sky. Um, Back in 2000, early, it was either late 2013 or early 2014. It was an exhibition championship match between Chris Saban and Austin Aries. Uh, Saban was the champion. And then it was two years before that at the uh, Genesis pay per view. It was uh, Gail Kim defending the Knockouts Championship against Mickey James with her friend Madison Rain in the Shark Cage. And Velvet Sky forced her in the Shark Cage. So that was the last time, last two times I recall. Both, I recall a major company using a shark cage as a gimmick. Before that, uh, you, I, we got to go back to the, the WCW, WWF, Night or Monday Night Raw. The, you have to go back to the Monday Night Wars, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I just had a popsicle, so you could say my tongue's a little cold. A little bit of a tongue twister. Yeah. Um, as, so, Paul Ellering was in the shark cage. So and so, this was a chance really for the authors of Pain and TM61 to have a clean match. Was it totally clean? Ninety percent. I'll get to the ten percent. It was a they they started off right off the bat. TM61 did, which was uh, which uh, was really good for um, for them because they really needed to show what they got. This was their first real. Um, takeover, takeover show, which it kind of sucks because they could be in contention for, for a number for the tax and titles right now, and instead one of them is out on the injured is out on the injured list. Um, he is out, and that that would be Shane Thorne. Nick Miller is stuck in purgatory until Shane Thorne comes back, and. Which really sucks for them. Um, yeah, man, it just it, it's sad. But as far as their match goes, it was actually a pre. It was actually a good match. It was the weakest match on the show, but that's not a bad thing. Um, and that's because authors of pain they weren't quite at the. They were still learning. Which, it was weird. In the next few months, they would have kick-ass matches. Now, granted, they were in there with DIY and the Revival, but they would still have some pretty kick-ass matches. And it's just amazing to me how far um, the Office of Pain have progressed. Uh, so there was fast base action from TM61. Big, strong powerhouse uh, moves from Office of Pain, Akam and Razor. Uh, the point of the match, when it did get a little bit hokey, I guess you could say... Paul Ellering had a steel chain, and he would he tossed the steel chain down to the floor so um, so uh, the officers of pain could use it. However, when one of them went to attack TM61, they were blocked, and the chain, instead of falling on the floor or something like that, it shot 
right into the crowd. I think it actually might have hit somebody. Hopefully nobody got hurt. But yeah, that chain, it shot into the crowd. Uh, it was uh, big time it shot into the crowd. Um, so you kind of, so they kind of had to create, to make up the finish as they went along. Um, yeah, the match didn't end soon after that with, uh, with, uh, I think the Authors of Pain, I keep thinking Hall of Pain, like, by Mark Henry. No, um, no, they, they, no, Mark Henry did not show up and manage the Authors of Pain, as sad as that, as often as that might be. Um, no, but they, they got the last chapter on, a on, on, uh, TM61. And, um, and that was that, that was that. So, with the exception of that one tiny spot from, um, with the exception of that one tiny spot from, uh, from, uh, yeah, from Paul Ellering, I don't know what's going on, from Paul Ellering, uh, it was a pretty good match, it really was. Next match was by far the match of the night, and what would have been the match of the year had we not gotten Sami Zayn and Shinsuke Nakamura. That is the tag team match between the two out of three falls, a two out of three falls match for the NXT Tag Team Championship between the, the champions of the Revival and Ch uh, Scott Dawson and Shane. Yeah, and Dash. I was going to say Shane Thorne. Scott Dawson. Yeah. Scott Dawson and Dash Wilder. And now with uh with um and DIY, which was um Tommaso Champion, Johnny Gargano. And they had a I got I'm gonna be honest right now, they had a fucking awesome match. I don't care what anybody says. These guys had a these guys had the most amount of time, they went over twenty minutes. Uh, and what was, for some people even, the match of the year. I still got to give it to Nakamura and Zayn. That, that was just freaking amazing. But, yeah, Sammy, Sam, oh, Sammy. Uh, but DIY and Revival, they come in at a close second. They had a kick-ass match back and forth for 20 minutes. The emotion was high. There was high emotion during this match. I can't name too many great spots because... There was a there was a fuck ton of great spots in this match. I'll give a I'll give the the, the cliff notes. DIY for, got the first pin by giving I believe it was Johnny Gargano the Shatter Machine, and then later on when they finally fought back, um, Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa gave the uh, gave I believe it was um, I believe it was Scott Dawson was it. Was it Scott Dawson? Or... Yeah, 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 it was. It was, uh, it, it was, uh, Scott Dawson. Uh, the, they report, they, they did that running knee kick, super kick thing. Uh, they never really gave that move a name. Which was weird. Um, but, it, but, the, that was, uh, that, that was, uh, pinfall number two. And number three... Um, they went really back and forth. Number three had finally happened. And, oh, oh, and by the way, they were also working over Johnny Gargano's knee, which was the reason why they lost at TakeOver Brooklyn that uh, last year. Now they're now here they are trying to uh, – DIY is trying to attack the knee again. So um, we had Gargano and uh, – uh, almost tap out, but he got to the ropes. And the, But then later in the match, the last spot in the match, which was amazing. Um, it was Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa got their respective, um, their, their respective, uh, submission holds on each member of the Revival. Um, and, which what, which, Gargano used a move called the Gargano Escape, which was basically, uh, the cross face, the, the, uh, Crippler cross face. Uh, although, um... In this case, uh, the cross face, like, it was, it was more like, uh, how D Drew Galloway does his cross face with the arm behind the, his opponent's head instead of just being on the mat or trapped in somebody's, and, or, or trapped in a, 
in uh in the person's arms. Instead, it was behind their back, so it hurt even more. It wasn't the rings of Saturn. I know that. It's similar to the rings of Saturn, but not completely. It's like a mix-up. And uh, and Tomasa Champa had an arm bar on uh on Scott Dawson. Dash Wilder was the one that had the Gargano escape on. Um, it's really weird to call submission hold and es the uh, Gargano escape, but no, it's just me. Anyways, what I loved it right here was that Gargano and Champa, Gargano and Champa, uh, Wilder and Dawson at first tried to like hold each other's hands to make sure to, to be like, let do not tap, do not tap. Eventually, they let go because of the pain, and both of them tapped simultaneously. The crowd exploded, and uh, you can never see these two guys were so freaking happy when they won those championships. They went into the crowd, they milked it for all it was worth, and uh, it made for a great moment, a great NXT takeover moment. It was a, it was a really, it was really fun and exciting to see these two, um, see these two have their moment. No homo. Anyways, uh, afterward, after that, and I was thinking, how can you follow up a match that fucking awesome? That was the second best match of the year, and some people's opinion, the best match of the year. How can you follow it up? Well, of course, they couldn't have matches that were as good as that, but uh, they did have some pretty good matches. Asuka defended her NXT Women's Championship against uh, the returning Mickey James. Mickey James came back. To WWE, this was her comeback. The crowds knew who Mickey James was, and they gave her an a, a great ovation. Not like not like amazing, but they gave her a big they gave her a big ovation when they when she came back. Um, the re and you're probably some of you are probably wondering why are they putting Mickey James in there. Well, the reason why is because NXT, especially at this time, were low on female talent. You think of the talent at the time. You had Ember Moon, but she, they obviously were billing her up for a later win. Um, you had Peyton Royce, Billy Kay, Liv Morgan. Uh, you had a couple of other women, but and you had Mandy Rose, who at the time made her was making NXT appearances. Now she just completely disappeared. Um, but yeah, that that was about it. So it's like we can't put any of these women on the NXT Takeover show, and we're building up Ember Moon. Who the hell are we going to put on the show? Well, they put on Mickey James. They did it because, well, we need an actually good talent. Because they knew. Because they knew it wouldn't have been believable if Liv Morgan or Billy Kay and Peyton Royce went in there to try to have a 15-minute match with Asuka. Because Asuka, in reality, would just kill them in two minutes. So, uh, yeah, that happened. And, um... So, uh... So that's why Mickey James, they offered Mickey James a comeback. Now, as for the match itself, really good match. Mickey James did not look worse for wear, despite the fact she's in her mid to late thirties now. She still looked every bit as good as she did back when she was first in WWE. Maybe even better due to her experience. Um, I will say the Mick kick is the only. If there's anything weird, if there's anything about Mickey James that seems a little bit too choreographed, it's the Mick kick. It doesn't look that devastating. It looks good when Aleister Black does it, but then Aleister Black is a complete badass. Mickey James is good, but uh, she's no Aleister Black. But uh, as for the match itself, it was a really good match. Uh, Mickey James tapped out to the Oscar lock, the cross face chicken wing. And uh, it was that. But really good match here. Definitely a memorable women, uh, NXT women's title match just for the just for the comeback of Mickey James, which was a lot of fun for a lot of us. Um, main event time. It was Shinsuke Nakamura defending the NXT Championship against Samoa Joe. They He had won it, the title, at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn uh, last year. So he was defending it here in Toronto. And um, I gotta say, like, I did tell my friend Lundrick later on, like, consider, looking at what happened, I wish DIY and the Revival main event of the show and then he told me even as as amazing as a great as a main event as it could have been you had to put some ojo nakamura at the, in the final match because the build-up was just so friggin epic and i gotta admit and i got to admit it was awesome uh samoa joe came out every week 
<laughs> basically saying, bring me Nakamura or bring me my championship. Bring me my title. The way he would mock William Regal was just amazing. Um, it was just really, really good. I don't know what else to say about it other than it was a really good, really nice build-up. Uh, the show itself was uh, was very good. Uh, the show itself. The match itself was very good. It was actually a great match. It wasn't on par as uh, Nakamura's previous matches. And for a while, it's kind of how it was going. Uh, Nakamura and Sami Zayn knocked it right out of the friggin' park at TakeOver uh, Dallas last year. Then the next show was TakeOver The End, which they got arguably had the best match of the night, which was, uh, it was Nakamura and Austin Aries. Then at Brooklyn, they had a great match, but it was lower in quality than both matches with Aries and Zayn. It was the match with Joe. Still a great match, though. Then it was a... Much, somewhat of a fast-paced match, but ironically enough, not as good as the Brooklyn match. His his takeover Brooklyn quality kept him going down and down up until about uh, uh, until his last takeover appearance, which was takeover um, Orlando, when he kind of bounced back a little bit. But for the most, but it, it's not that he was coasting; it's just that he was working. Uh, he he was working. He was he he was just working. Uh, <coughs> Slow paced. You can do that. There were some guys you could do that with, but some guys you just have to work fast paced with. Um, Joe, I get the feeling he he can work both slow and fast paced. Bobby Roode is definitely a slow paced wrestler, so it worked more for him than it did with Joe. But uh, speaking of Joe, he won the match. That's right. Samoa Joe actually was actually the first ever two time NXT champion. And it was uh, it was amazing to think about. It's amazing to think about how he was the first ever two time NXT champion. Then Nakamura won the title back at a. It was the new. It was the. Uh, it was their match in Osaka, and then they had a rematch in uh in Mel not Melbourne, Australia. It was, I think it was a. Uh, it was in Australia. I, I just don't think it was Melbourne. It was uh, I think it was Sydney. I, I honestly uh, can't remember. But anyways, they had a match in Australia and they had a match in Japan. In Canada, in the U.S., they had matches everywhere. Uh, I guess it was in high. I guess Joe Chris Nakamura was in high demand. Uh, anyways, you had the um, you had a great match. The finish of the match was also somewhat unique. Basically, Nakamura was about to attack Joe on the outside, and uh, and. Joe kicked him, Joe, I think he ran him to the steel steps, kicked him right in the balls, went for the muscle buster in the ring, and then one, two, three, pinned Nakamura for the championship. <coughs> Which was really nice for Joe to have. Uh, because he never got an NXT TakeOver win. Remember, he won his first title at a title at a house show. So it was nice that he got a title win here. So, great show. De had one of the best matches all year last year. And uh, that's all I gotta say. Great show, and I'll see it. And guys, I'll see you next time with my Takeover San Antonio review. Uh, so be well, stay safe, have a good day. Check the show out, or else I will rip your balls off. Mm, just kidding. But seriously, guys, see you later. Have a good day.